Grab right. middle seat. It's a full flight. Dave, welcome everybody. Super excited to be here with you guys today. Oh, what's up, Graham? I see you. Uh, we're just going to drop the agenda for you guys for today's uh, session. We got a jam-packed session for you, and we're so excited. You know, uh, MVP, of course, is really, this is all about the young people. So we are so, so fortunate to have one of our incredible alumni to be at the epicenter of this presentation about school culture. Um, so yes, why don't we just do quick introductions, uh, Eva, real quick, where you are, Zelia, where you at, and then we'll uh, do the pick me up and get it going. You gonna show our picture? Oh sure. All right, hold on. This is how we. Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Eva Mikia. I'm the chief program and strategy officer at Big Picture, and uh, want to tell you why the heck I would care to do a session about school culture, and. Um, I want to start by telling you that I, the picture that Sun's about to show, um, is a picture of where I grew up. I actually moved to the States in uh, middle school, not knowing much English. And that'll teach you after being, um, sort of being the weird kid in school and uh, years of not fitting in and not understanding kind of like um, how customs happen in the U.S., being told I do things a little oddly, I wear, you know, colorful stuff and um, maybe talk to pants a little too much or um, my parents have weird accents. Um, I, I feel like it made me a bit of a cultural anthropologist and since then professionally I've been a uh, social worker where I realized that it's not just immigrants who experience this kind of exclusion and, um, and I realized that I had a lot of um, all my clients were actually all the people that um, didn't fit in and that really struggled in our education system and in our communities. Um, and since then, I spent a lot of years working on uh, coaching folks, uh, school folks and school teams around improvement and human-centered design. And the beautiful thing that I found out is that it turns out culture and, um, and these structures that have been exclus uh, exclusionary and um, leave people out are man-made, actually. They're totally created by us and therefore they can be dismantled and they can be um, you, you can create a different kind of culture. So um, that's sort of the, the spirit with which I come to this session is, is both a, a personal and professional um, lesson, being a student of uh, a culture. And of course, we think, we're biased, we think this is the best um, talk, topic for a headliner because um, really school culture is the secret sauce uh, of big picture. So it's really an honor to be able to um, dive into this topic with you all and with my wonderful co-presenters, Zelia and, and Sun. So I'll pass it over to maybe Zelia. Yeah. Hold on. Bam. Uh. Thank you, Eva. Um, yeah, so my name is Zelia Gonzalez. I'm from Sacramento, California, and I went to Met Sacramento. Um, and these are some lovely pictures of my advisory. So my first advisory on the right, um, that was us hanging out in the park near our school. Um, and my second advisory on the left is all of us, we crammed into a photo booth at our prom to take an advisory photo because we all wanted something to remember um, together. Uh, culture is interesting to me because um, as like a multiracial person and someone um, with a more, uh, my dad's side, he didn't really get to be raised in culture and in any, um, well he did, but he didn't get to be raised in any sort of like ethnic culture because his mom really wasn't around for that. So he kind of defined what his life would be like on his own, uh, living downtown and raising himself and his brother. And so a lot of those values are instilled in me. And so it's made my life um, interesting in that I don't really, uh, it's hard for me to relate to certain ideas of culture and things like that, because my family feels so niche in and of itself. I like to say that like, um, I'm just Californian when people ask me what I am, <laughs> or I say, <laughs> Sacramentan because it feels like Sacramento values and the values that my dad picked up growing here has raised me more than anything. Um, and so, you know, he's instilled in me a lot of self-reflection, valuing, um, you know, just uh, friendships and happiness a lot more than money. And um, 
to question authority was something that I grew up with a lot and to question what uh, I've been told and what we've been told about our communities and our, and our lifestyle. And so when I was going to traditional schools, those things just didn't really mesh um, with what I knew and understood from my family about what our values were and how to look at the world. And so going to the Met, um, I was fully allowed uh, to question authority <laughs> and to um, kind of yeah. what I wanted to do. And so these are my advisories where all of us got to do and uh, I'm happy to share like what kind of created that in our advisory space that we were all allowed to question what we previously thought and question what we knew around us. So yeah, thank you. Thank you, Zelia. And just quickly, I'll show you mine. Go ahead, y'all. Y'all can laugh. Go ahead. I, I want to hear some laughter. Uh, that beautiful- you're not, you're not wearing the, the, a matching outfit today. You're, you guys are super lucky I don't have that orange. I think that's a chicken on that. Like, I'm, I'm right in the middle. That's my mom. We that's need to get dad. you a grown-up version. Yeah, I think, I, I think we got to do that for, like, uh, sibling day. I think we have a sibling day. My brother and I got to get down like this. <laughs> I want to know what kind of car that is. <laughs> it's an Oldsmobile, bro. Um, I share this with you uh, because I am uh, uh, pretty much a young man descendant of genocide survivors. I am 100% uh, Cambodian, uh, and my parents survived one of the worst genocides known to man. Two million of uh, my people were brutally massacred. Um, and I bring this up to you because uh, my culture is who I am. And for majority of my public school education, when I walk into this space and I think about school, um, beyond International Day, where we made egg rolls and fried rice, which now that I think about it was some of the most stereotypical things that an Asian family can bring, uh, that was as much culture that was honored for me as a young person when I walked into school. Um, and what we're trying to do uh, in the big picture design is really honor the whole student. And it's not something, it's not a day or not, or not anything like that, it's practice day in and day out, and how do we honor our young people and their reality, and when they walk in, they bring their culture, they are culture, and it becomes a piece of the fabric that becomes the school culture, and how do we as educators truly lock into that and honor that and value that? Um, I think there's a really, really powerful note. So beyond the embarrassing picture that my parents somehow thought that yellow short, red, I don't know. Uh, there's something bigger than this, fam, and it's just that we all bring a piece of our culture into school, and the ultimate question is how do we honor that and celebrate that? So we'll talk a little bit about that today. So, all right. Um, but before we do that, in typical, typical BPL fashion, uh, we build community through our pick-me-ups and our gatherings. So if you take a look at the agenda, I'll share the agenda again real quick. We got a challenge for y'all. We want you to get up and get moving. Everybody's at their house right now. Um, some form of shelter. Let me get out of here. Oh, Dave, can't, am I sharing this? Hold on. Why can't I get out? Oh, thank you. All right. So we, we're going to do a scavenger hunt right now, family. So we're gonna give a short amount of time. We're gonna give you guys three minutes, okay? Three minutes, and we need you to find four objects in your house right now and bring back to us. We, wanna, we want you to bring back an object that you are most proud of, that's in your house. Bring back an object that you are most embarrassed about, just like my picture I just shared you guys. We want you to bring an object that inspires you the most, and we want you to bring an object that says a lot about you or your family. Okay, so listen, let's be silly about this. Let's be vulnerable as part of our culture anyways to be our authentic selves. I'm asking folks to be your authentic self. You need to find four items, what you're most proud of, what you're most embarrassed about, what inspires you and what says a lot about you and your family. You've got three minutes. I'm gonna put some music on. Go and get your four items and meet, meet us back in three minutes, y'all. So uh, typically, you know, we debrief and we, we sh share out a little bit, but we're short on time. So we, we hope that you guys had a chance to share a little bit about your life um, uh, with and spreading your joy with someone else and letting them in into your world a little bit. 
Um, really, I just want to jump into a processing question and I'll just ask one and this is open to everybody. So, but I want to be clear, we're not going to be able to hear from everyone, but maybe one or two people, but trying to process this a little bit. So uh, here's an interesting question, like what cultural values are honored in asking folks to be their authentic selves? So we're asking you to bring objects that represent certain things to you. So what inference can we make about that if someone wants to share? Once again, what cultural values are being honored when we ask folks to be their authentic selves? And you don't have to raise your hand, you just have to unmute yourself and go. If not, I will volunteer someone right now. Don't make me do it. I'm looking at the screens right now. Someone hop in and share because this is a safe space. So I'll, I'll try. Um, hey, Kurt, go ahead, Kurt. I, I think you um, build, I think you can create a pathway to interest-based learning when you're doing this um, because our choices are very revealing um, of our values and our thinking. Um, and then there's just a little bit of edge with the embarrassment question. It, it finds out for the facilitators just, gosh, how, who's going to take a risk? Who's not going to take a risk? Um, so I think it just reveals interests and potential shared values. So it builds community as well. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you, Kurt. Maybe one more person. Um, hi, um, I think it built humility and vulnerability because you don't know if what you're sharing is going to be accepted by the people who's, who's listening, you know? And as you share these things, you're revealing a part of who you are and it takes courage to do that. Yeah, spot on. Spot on. A lot of finger snaps for that. Um, I want to thank all of you guys for sharing a, a little bit because it's true. It takes a little bit of courage, especially just meeting folks out of nowhere. But that is what we are trying to uh, promote, advocate for, and really talk about is how do we honor young people and their authentic selves when they walk into our schools every single day? When are the strategic design spaces where we can leverage their life, who they are, what they love, what they represent, um, that, you know, of course, their cultural background. Uh, but this is just a small example. And Kurt really hit it off because this is one of the uh, activities that we do in advisory to start uh, exploring career interests um, because it starts with things like this. So, so yes. So uh, on the agenda, um, I just have before can yeah. I jump in before you move on? I just want to give you a couple of uh, pro tips and a couple of things. Um, just notice the, um, you know, there's a lot like, oh, what can be done on the virtual space? Like we did a scavenger hunt that actually would be harder to do to get people to bring an object. Like I'm always the person that forgot to bring the object sometimes, like if you did a session. So there's a, a way that it can be an actual strength in a, in a bit of intimacy. The things I, I brought to my uh, group, I probably wouldn't have brought um, if we were somewhere at school. So that's kind of an, a nice thing. Um, and then we intentionally focused on objects because um, culture, we want to really draw the connection that culture lives in things um, in a lot of ways. And sometimes we can talk from the head about what, what culture we think we have, um, but the structures, the buildings, the, the signage, the policies, they really don't follow what we think. So there's a, a little bit of proof in the pudding. And so I want to, today as you're thinking, as we're thinking about culture, just keep thinking about that connection between culture and an aspirational culture and the actual um, structures, buildings, signage, policies, uh, rules, and, and ways of, of, of doing things and, and where that matches. So um, be on the lookout for that kind of stuff. And definitely steal the activity. Yeah. Thank you, Eva. Um, so if you take a look at the agenda family, uh, I, uh, we're a little bit behind time, but it's good because we definitely value uh, that aspect um, uh, pick me up, but also the sort of bringing folks together and strengthening our relationships is at the heart of what we do. So I'll quickly, I'll just talk about our norms in this virtual space when we're together. Um, again, norms are not rules. There's no consequences. Rather, it's a set of values that we all are trying to uh, uphold for ourselves and each other. Uh, so norms are very important when we're with 
our young people because they help us uh, co-create that, right? And that's what we want for them to bring their authentic selves. And they, so they play a part in that as well. But for us, we created some five general ones that we hope you guys can honor with us. So the norms are being fully pre present and willing to try things on. Meaning like, you don't have to necessarily like, you know, when you go to the store, you buy stuff. Well, you could try stuff on, it'll be fine as well. So we're not trying to do anything like concrete for today anyways, but just be willing to. Um, seeking to understand and work to be understood. We all come from different walks of life, different perspectives. So um, equity of voice, we wanna make sure that we hear from everybody or get a chance, everybody gets a chance to contribute. Uh, we're gonna agree to disagree, pretty much. We don't agree on everything and that's completely okay. Um, we're a safe space for us to talk about our opinions and beliefs about things and uh, for the betterment uh, of, uh, of all of us. And lastly, just everything moves uh, forward. So anything with our work, we don't want to be stagnant. We want to, uh, you know, have those courageous conversations and then uh, everything moves our work forward. So those are just some of the norms. Um, I'm, if you have the agenda, we'll leave it there to save some time. I won't review it. Uh, but we'll jump right in, into it, and I'll just hand it off to my co-presenter, Zelia and Eva. Sounds good. And we've got a couple of activities today, but we wanted to start by, um, I'm going to be interviewing Zelia and having her tell us about what her school experience was like. And as I do this, though, it would be really boring if you were just kind of listening to us. But instead, what we did is we sent you a bingo sheet. Um, does that sound familiar? And if you have it printed, I see some people. I saw a funny thing about how most of us were living off of our work printers, so we don't really have, but some of us, yeah, there you go. So if you have it, if not, follow along online. I think it's more fun to do it online, but as I interview her, you're gonna look for examples that fit your bingo sheet. So if she says something about uh, of trust a relationship, you've got a box in there and so put the quote or put something that reminds you of that. And then she put a little bit of a DYO, which was do your own. Is that what it, the, the middle spot is a, is a free spot. So, um, so you get that one. And then I want you to yell out. Um, and I can put, um, Sun, can you put the bingo sheet link in the chat box? Thank you. Uh, for those following along and yeah and maybe call out um in the chat box when you've got bingo um yell it out maybe in all caps uh so you, we'll see we'll see where we go all right you we were son you're muted <laughs> rookie mistake I was just wondering if we can read the definition for culture for bpl schools real quick before of course please Oh, you want me to do it? <laughs> you got the great idea. All right, all right, all right. So school culture, BPL style, and big picture schools, there is palpable trust, respect, and equality between and among students and adults. Students take leadership roles in the schools, and teamwork defines the adult culture. Student voice is valued in the school decision-making process, and visitors are struck by the ease with which students interact with adults. So just Thank some you. of the elements, yeah, some of the elements of school culture. And Celia has been really kind to be willing to share, vulnerable and share her experience. Um, we're doing this as an exercise, a bit of a, of um, showing, not, not um, you know, showing some of her experience. It doesn't mean that this, that she went to the like perfect school and it doesn't mean that that, that school had everything figured out or even that that uh, culture is exactly the right culture for every school. Uh, we're just showing you an example. We think those, you know, those def those things that Sun just said are the distinguishers for big picture culture. Um, it may or may not be right for your context, um, but this is a way to uh, show and put it on there. Uh, <laughs> yes, we we do have some representations from MedSAC, so they would say maybe that it was the perfect school. Uh, so a little bit of cultural pride, uh, a little pride. But with that, let's start. Um, Cecilia, sure. start by telling us a little bit um, about what was your a day in the life of a student when you were there. 
Heck yeah. Um, so the Met Sacramento uh, is downtown. So I would uh, take the light rail and it's like literally a bus stop right at the school. Uh, I didn't actually start off going to the Met Big Picture though, um, or the Met Sacramento. I went to McClatchy High School. If anyone's familiar with Sacramento, that's like the big 3,000 person high school that everyone goes to in kind of like the middle downtown Sacramento area. Um, and I was in one of those like, you know, fancy literature programs and stuff like that. Um, but the first semester I was like pretty much bored out of my mind. Um, <laughs> I was really unhappy there and I was pretty checked out. I was working though until like 2 a.m. most nights um, just to just to do the work that was assigned me, but I wasn't really learning anything. So I started looking for other schools to go to and I realized like the one, the only one in the district that was like significantly different was gonna be the Met. And so my freshman year, um, I jumped in halfway, right? So everyone else had had a chance to like kind of choose the advisor that they wanted and they had a chance to like learn about the school a little bit more. And I was kind of jumped in and they were like, uh, you know, here, um, I, I was sort of just jumping into it and they were like, you gotta find an internship and you gotta do all these things. So um, my freshman year, I spent a lot of time like on Tuesdays and Thursdays when people were out at their internships, just figuring out how to do a resume and my cover letter. And I thought I wanted to be a teacher my freshman year. So I went to go work <laughs> at an elementary school. I lasted two weeks and I couldn't do it and I left. <laughs> and then uh, I found a job at the, we had a school bike repair shop. Um, and so I ended up working the rest of my first year there. Um, and that was a great semester. I hadn't started going to college classes yet. I had just started taking like a class that's supposed to enter you into the college classes. So it was just getting a lot of like knowing my surroundings and meeting people there. And there were so many different types of people, but I felt like at McClatchy, maybe I couldn't talk to people that were so different than me. It was such a big school. People were quite segregated and at the Met, people that were very different than you were in your advisory, in your family at school. So. Yeah, we weren't quite family yet, but we knew that that's where we were headed. And so that was nice. And then senior year, um, drastically different lifestyle. Uh, I was out and about all the time. I was in my second year at a city council office. And so I had a lot of freedom and projects, like big projects that I was working at there. Um, and by... Uh, that time I also had done so many college classes that I didn't really have classes to take at the Met. So I had worked out because of the projects that I was doing at my internship and because of my transcript, I had worked out where I could uh, go to my internship four days a week and just show up on Fridays for my English class. Um, and so that was, that was really nice. And then on Fridays, you know, I was just, uh, we had open lunches for juniors and seniors if you passed Gateway. So I would pop in in the morning, I'd TA a few classes, I'd go to English class, hang out with all my friends, do my projects, go to lunch, come back, do the rest of my work for the day, um, do kick me out. And that was like the best senior year ever because I was working so hard in all my classes and on my big projects. And I actually had time to do the things that I wanted. So um, freshman year to senior year, drastically different in uh, responsibilities, but also freedoms, so. Nice, thank you. That's a, that's a pretty good full picture. Okay. <laughs> no pun intended, thank you. Um, and now I know it wasn't all roses and it wasn't all pretty. So if you're willing to share with us, we'd love to hear about a time when you struggled and how, what that was like and how the school responded and, mm. um, you know. Yeah. Part of that developmental journey. Yeah, um, probably. I mean, there was a couple hard moments. Gateways, if anyone's familiar with that, is like the big um, presentations and projects you have to do your sophomore year to move on to the higher levels, um, the higher grades. And those were super hard. I was up in, I was like doing, that was my first all-nighter was trying to finish my gateway um, and just trying to do it to the quality that I knew I wanted it. Um, and that was really hard because yeah, some things, you know, when you know you haven't put the right amount of work in or it's not the way you want it, like being in front of a peer, like panel and your teachers and stuff, it's really hard to present things you're not proud of. And so that was probably like one of the hardest moments for me. And then also, um, I think my junior or sophomore year, I had failed a college class, a city college class. I had failed a statistics class. And that was like, 
pretty devastating. I was, um, you know, never really had an F before. And I, uh, you know, pretty much prided myself on my math abilities and my school abilities and being able to be like, I'm doing all these things at City College. Um, but I failed. And uh, I knew why. It was because I was focusing on a lot of other projects. And I was running like a high school like organization, like uh, outside of the med and all of these other things. And so it was a really good stopping moment for me, though, to be like, "Ooh, I really need to start prioritizing all the things that I care about and what I'm doing. Like, obviously, this class wasn't a priority for me, but should it have been like if I took on this responsibility and said I needed to do that? Like, so I had a real reckoning moment with myself where I was like, OK, an F is not the end of the world. You had chosen to do all of these other things and that's what your priority was, but you still got to kind of make up for that and figure out if that F you need to fix that to do what you want to do in the future. So yeah, that was, those were hard moments, but the school was really good about it. I mean, I told my advisor and I was like, Ooh, I got an F and they're like, okay, well you can make it up. <laughs> you can retake the class. And I was like, Oh, okay. I was like, awesome. And so presenting that at my gateway, I, gave my reasons for why I had an F and I took responsibility for what I needed to do and presented my plan going forward. So that, that was kind of how it got handled. Wow. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. How wonderful that you had that experience to decide for yourself what really mattered among knowing you, I know you have no, no shortness of, uh, of um, passions and interest and talent. So it's a good lesson for you to be thinking about uh, which ones matter at what time and, yeah, and honestly, be able to decide God, that for yourself. Yeah. Thank God that happened to me in high school and not college. <laughs> Cause I didn't really have like a, you know, the best thing I think about the Met is like having a safety net to try and fail. Um, and I think that's what makes it so different than other schools. Cause so many other schools, like you go to, um, you go to McClatchy or something like that, you don't really have these opportunities to push yourself. Well, at least I didn't there. And then, um, you get into college and no one's there to be like, oh, it's fine. Just retake that class or do that. And like, you're totally okay. Like the, those support systems and relationships aren't there to be like, that's just one little thing, you know? So I was really grateful that I had that experience so that when I wasn't doing too hot in college, I'd be like, I'm managing my time and I've got my priorities. And <laughs> Now, sometimes the misconception though, is in that sort of supportive environment. People think that like, it, it's sort of everything goes. And it's like, it's okay if you fail, we love you anyways, everything's okay. Talk to me about how teachers and advisors and uh, folks at your school, did they really push you and how and what did that look like? Oh yeah, yeah, that, uh, the like, it's okay, you can retake the class didn't come without the like, well, why did you fail? What happened? And like the really intense, like critical questions about like, you know, my priorities and my time. That was definitely a part of why I, thought about things so critically and had to like reassess my, you know, spheres of what I was paying attention to. Um, teachers were not, they're not easy on you. I honestly feel like teachers are harder on you at the Met because they know your life. They know what you're capable of. Like the one student at a time, like doesn't just mean that people are like, they, they know you. It's like meeting you where you're at. And then the next step is pushing you where you're at. So it's not like having everyone at this level. It's like being able to push everyone a little bit at where they're going. Um, and I had like, that was not the only moment where I was like, um, like uh, having a problem in school or doing something that other people might have seen as with more punitive lens. Like I was struggling in a math class um, before that too, before I had started going to City College, I was in an Algebra 2 class at school. And uh, one of my favorite teachers now um, was like, you got to get out of this class. <laughs> and he kicked me out because I was bothering students all the time and I was coming in and I had all my work done. But because of that, I would like distract other students and I'd bother them. And so, um, you know, instead of, you know, kicking me out to detention or putting me in the hallway and, you know, something like that, he was like, you got to go to my city college class because you're bothering everyone in here because you're not doing, <laughs> you're already done your work and stuff like that. Um, <laughs> yes, I was kicked out of class. Um, and then I also, I mean, I've been kicked out of another class too. Damn. Uh, I was uh, having trouble interacting with one of my advisors and so we mutually decided that I should switch to another advisory and I think like 
I was kind of given permission at the Met to allow myself to question things because I don't think that, and then I was rewarded or not rewarded necessarily, but worked with really well when I was questioning and I was having trouble and I was doing all these things. Like in any other school, I would have been sent to detention every one of those times, labeled a problem child and all of these things. But those experiences didn't take away from the respect that my teachers had for me. And it created mutual respect when they saw me for everything that I was and the questions and the problems that I had in those classrooms. Um, yeah, I know. I'm sorry. I went a lot of different ways there, but. <laughs> love it. Love it. No, well, all good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'll ask probably just a, a one or two more questions and definitely open to if you've got stuff in the chat box you want to know. Um, you can put it in the chat box and if you also have like a missing square that you really want to like ask a leading question it's okay we can do that too no one, i don't think anyone's yelled out bingo yet right son you're still on mute son nope i, I haven't heard anybody yet all right all right um so tell me you know since we're talking about culture like what um and the connection between culture and rules like mm -hmm. what rules were important um at your school and 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 how how did you know that they were important yeah that's a good question rules is a hard word because i don't remember ever seeing any rules at the met <laughs> i don't remember ever like in a lot of other schools you walk in and they literally have like behavior standards as the first poster it's a pretty poster but it's behavior standards on the wall and uh we don't have any of those at the met i think that like if i had to like break it down like what guided behavior and opportunities and like responsibilities and would probably be like honesty and trust. Um, like I got to do a lot my senior year and be able to, you know, leave for four um, days of the school semester or the school week and then come in on Fridays because they knew where I was. They trusted me. I didn't have a tracker on me or anything. They <coughs> trusted that when I said I was going to my internship, I was there because over the years that I was there, I had built up relationships that I was always where I was supposed to be. And I was doing the things that I cared about and I was passionate about those projects. Um, and I had relationships with teachers. And so I think that like relationships built on honesty and trust were the guiding principles. Like if I knew a lot of students who didn't have as many privileges, I think, or that didn't get to go, um, and like go out during like free lunch period and stuff like that um and it was because if they like lied about where they were and stuff like that so those were the guiding principles of like what allowed people to do things um or not at school but what was always always open was that like internships you always had the opportunity to go to internships and i think that that's like my favorite part about the met is that like it's not you know how in elementary school when like kids are acting up and stuff like that, they will take away recess? The most formative, most amazing part of the day for young people and they take that away as punishment, like that was not the Met style at all. We would never take away an internship that you were doing well at and succeeding and you loved because there was an issue somewhere else because of that. Like that was not, at least that's not how I saw things were done. And granted, I have a lot of like privilege with like, you know, my skin color and just who I am and the way that I talk and the way that my dad raised me, like I'm listened to. And I'm like, you know, the kind of like white innocence thing. I'm like able to push buttons and to think about things difficult, um, like in a more difficult and, you know, way than other students. Um, but from what I saw, for the most part, that was like something that was supported of all students. Um, but that's something to think about too, for sure. And maybe that's a good question to part on is if you can share a little bit about some of the other students that maybe had a different uh, experience and different trajectories than you did. Um, maybe back to that advisory picture, uh, mm -hmm. some of those folks. In addition to being really good at fitting into small spaces, what else can you tell us about some of their journeys? Oh man, all my friends did super cool stuff. And I, I want to make clear, like it, you could have picked anyone walking down the hallway at the Met and like put them right here and they could have told you 
all the super cool things that they were doing and talked exactly about our school in the exact same way. We got really good at being able to present and articulate ourselves at school. So really anyone, like some of my friends, um, I had a friend Morrissey who actually works at the auto body shop down the street from me. I just took my car to him the other day, um, but that was his internship and that turned into a job and he's like <laughs> a certified VW mechanic now, which is so freaking cool. I had another friend who um, worked at as an EMT dispatcher until she was old enough that the EMT company paid for her EMT training. And then she became an EMT for them because she wanted to be a life medic, um, like a copter medic or whatever. And so that was her internship. I had another friend who um, worked at GameStop and at like 16 years old, he had the keys to like close at the mall and like completely like ran that store essentially. Um, and then one of my really good friends um, owned a farm and he ended like he owned like the largest vegetable farm in Northern California and he ended up um, having his own intern senior year for his projects and stuff like that from the Met. So that was really cool. Um, but yeah, just really, I want to make it clear that like everyone was so individual in what they were doing and you could ask anyone and stop them and say tell me about your internship and they could go off for like two hours explaining all the intricate details about you know what they're doing and why it's important what they care about and how awesome the people they're working are with so thank you Celio. doesn't she make you want to move to sacramento <laughs> <laughs> I always love hearing about your experiences and also the connections and, and how they, they last long. So now it's been a couple of years and, and those, those relationships are. Oh no. Oh, you got. Oh. oh, I said all those relationships are, are still there. Yeah. Um, a thousand percent. I just went camping with one of my friends from my advisory and we don't even like we didn't get to like bond a ton until after high school when we really started to like share stories and talk to each other. And so we just went camping, it was so cool. Beautiful, beautiful. I would love to hear from some of our bingo winners. What did you, yes. what did you notice? Bing, bing. Please share. Um, let's, let's run them down, let's run them down. Come in, we'll start at the third person that hit me up, Denise. Denise, you want to share one and call out that uh, that value around culture and what you heard? Yeah. Um, under the norms to overcome conflict, mm -hmm. one of the things I heard was that there was that peer pressure piece of exhibiting that panel and having that be a motivator and that there was no rules. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our second bingo person, Katie. Katie, can you chime in with one as well? Sure. Um, under the genuine care and regard, um, when Zelia was talking about um, the safety net she had to take risks, like it was a good time to be in high school and be able to take those college courses that, yeah, you might fail, but um, you're, you have like a family around you that's gonna help and support you and push you to reflect on it and make you realize all the great things that you've been doing that you prioritize. So I thought that was really awesome and inspiring. Nice, nice. And our first bingo, Derek, step up to the mic. Yes, yes, yes. I, uh, did anybody do norms overcome conflict? I'm, I'm going to do that one. Uh, yeah, well, one just did it, but go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. You good. Oh, okay. Well, I'll do something else. I'll do the, uh, do the trust one. So uh, what I like, what I saw about trust <clears throat> was that uh, she talked about her relationship with her advisor and how uh, it was definitely uh, how they had to grow and had to build a trust and how they had, she would listen to what they had to say. And so like, like their opinions were valuable to her and she knew that they saw in her things that she might not have seen. And so she trusted and relied upon their vision uh, and their, uh, uh, just like they're invested in, in her. So she's trusting them and what they're saying and then listening to them. Like whether it be getting out of the college class when they told her to get out of the class or switching advisories, having a conversation, that all that takes trust. And so that's kind of what I put right there. Got you. Thank you so much, Derek. Uh, to everybody else, we want to open it up to, to everyone as well to chime in as well. Maybe we get two other people. What did you hear? 
that really exemplified culture in uh, Zelia's uh, school experience at the Met SAC. I can jump in. Yeah. Um, the the talk around like the the rigor of gateways really spoke to the excellence piece and um, and it was obvious when when Zelia was talking about how she was trying to balance so many things that it was expected that she do well at all of those things right and so learning that lesson of well I can't do well or I can't be excellent at all of these things really speaks to the culture of excellence um, that is in that school. Awesome. Thank you so much, Monica. And maybe one more person. I'll go. Yay, uh, Beverly, go ahead. I just think um, that there was a continuous theme about the importance of relationships, um, whether it was talking about how um, there weren't, it didn't seem like there were a lot of rules because things were built on trust or the expectations being high, like high rigor, high excellence, expectations of excellence because your teachers and advisors knew you and knew what to expect and knew how to guide you one student at a time. So I just think um, there was so much based on relationships that you said that was really powerful. Gotcha. gotcha. Beautiful. I've heard uh, Dennis say, and I think Elliot too, who's around, um, that trusting young people may have been the most innovative thing that they did 25 years ago. And that they were told many, many times that they were crazy for, you know what, you're gonna let kids do what they want to do, you're gonna let them go off campus. It's called ditching when I was in school. Um, so that trust is really no small leap. And I, I know as we were preparing for this, um, and especially given the conversations around uh, race and racism in this country, uh, we were reflecting about uh, about just how radical it is, especially to trust um, young people who everywhere else in their life they experience um, being questioned and not trusted and not allowed to police and, and, and not to be free in their own bodies um, in, in this place. So um, that is not a small thing. It's, it's really a radical act um, that's beautiful and embedded into uh, the whole design. So I want you to be thinking about that as well um, and, and in, wh in which ways you want to accommodate and, and, and be uh, congruent with the local culture that you're in and in what ways you're purposefully uh, disrupting that culture um, that your schools are in. Um, so with that, I think it's a it's a good good time. Unless my co-presenters want to, or Leela, you want to have the last word on this? No, I think you guys covered it. That was great. It was fun. Thank you, thank you for playing along. Um, also, a little gift from us. Uh, definitely steal that one, and you can either steal the general idea with your staff. Um, could be fun to do it also with the students. And what they say, you know, it's a little bit of a cultural self-assessment. Uh, we're having, you know, you bring some students to talk about their experience in front of your teachers and see if they can fill it out and say, hey, if we can't, maybe there's some values that we thought were really strong and we're not seeing them. So it's, it's, a, it's a fun way to do a self-assessment. Again, can be done online. So um, some, some ideas for you here. And with that, uh, we're going to turn hey, it over to you. Yeah, please. Oh, a, lot of a lot of times people think that you can't talk about multiple narratives at the same time. It kind of stress that. You can't talk about data and culture. And if you look at the data around young people from the 1800s to now, their freedom of movement has been constrained in and outside of school, inside of school to the point where a U.S. Marine recruit or a convicted felon has more freedom of movement inside a uh, of, of a place and a student inside of a school. And that's laws on the books. So if you can't move, you can't learn. It's that simple. Both in and outside of school, just the freedom of movement and access in and around a place is, is so vital and important and missing. It's a simple act and it's part of a culture. And if you are checked into a school with security and fences and TV cameras and everything about the place that you're walking into tells you that they don't trust you to Eva's point, then you know, you know inside that they don't trust you. It doesn't matter what they say. 
So there's a big, big part of this for any and all schools to come to terms with. Thank you. Uh, so true. So true. So I, I just want to say, for those that don't know, that's the godfather himself, Elliot Washer, co-founder of the BPL Design. I just wanted to throw it out there. So fortunate to have him drop his gems of wisdom. Love him being here. Thank you all. Yeah. Yeah. We have a bunch of, uh, well, a bunch of um, big picture uh, expertise and also folks from school staff too. So also chat box is a great time. Definitely chime in, but other points, definitely it's good to, to put in the chat box. All right, Zelia, yeah, I can share the agenda. You want to talk through and walk people as we go into breakout groups? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we're going to need some breakout groups, Mr. Berg. Um, that's so weird. I've never called him Mr. Berg in my life. His name is David. <laughs> He's at school. I used to be an advisor at this school. And <laughs> Julia was one of our students, just to get the subtext here. So, oh, it's so um, funny. Yes. Oh my gosh. Maybe the after workshop will will interview David about Zelia. <laughs> Um, okay, so this next part, we're going to do exactly what we've been doing, but um, kind of take it uh, like you'll be able to see it in action. We're going to, we asked you guys for um, photos and you guys sent us in amazing photos. I had to pare it down a little bit and so that we got 10, um, but we're going to go into this mural. I don't know how many people are familiar, but it's pretty easy. There's a link that you can click in and you'll be in an anonymous group and then, um, or an anonymous animal on that mural. And when you go into your breakout groups, um, the number of your breakout group, you're gonna go to that photo on the mural and you're gonna add sticky notes by double clicking your mouse um, to, talk, to place the sticky notes on top of what value you see represented in that photo. Thank you for me um, showing it, that's awesome. Does anyone have any questions? How long do, would you like? Uh, good question, let's say um, seven minutes. Seven minutes. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Okay. All right. People are coming in. All right. Looks like folks are all coming back now. All right. Cool. Cool. Uh, so I, I messed up. I didn't give the best directions on that, but it seems like you guys picked it up really well <laughs> and figured it out. Um, but I hope that some people had a chance to maybe reflect um, from that on what their own school looks like and what culture, like exactly what you were saying, Eva, is like, what um, could they be reflecting on their own culture? What would students say? What does your school cafeteria look like? And how does that share? What values you espouse or you want or if it doesn't, um, yeah. Should we do that second part? We had talked about um, considering uh, everything discussed, um, what do you see or what do you not see now in your own schools? Uh, yeah, does anyone wanna share out with something that it made them think about their own school culture? I'd love to hear from like three to five people about what it, what it sparked for them about their own schools. You can just speak up. And some of you have the added benefit of feedback. So some of the, you, those were the pictures. So as a thank you for sharing those pictures, you're gonna get some of that feedback of what people saw in your pictures. Be brave. Someone share something. <laughs> I'll be brave. And well, I will say, thank you, Michelle. And I will say we have a long way to go. That's what I'll say. And I will, and I will, and I will be vulnerable and say that I wish that I had all 80 of my teachers behind me to say, so that I could turn over my shoulder and say, see what you think is relationships is not that. So that's what we're shooting for. But what you have ain't that. So, mm. <laughs> so I'll admit that. Mm. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, that's, it's hard when it's your own teachers in your own school. <laughs> um, yeah, it's hard when they think what they have is, is it, and you know that it's not it, so. Mm -hmm. Totally. Does anyone want to share based off of Michelle's bravery? Thank you. Maybe just one other person. I'll share. Oh, okay. Thanks. I saw Monica too, so you're not off the hook. You got to speak after. <laughs> Go on, Derek. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, 
I, we had the uh, number seven uh, elementary school, and uh, so we had talked about a lot of things. It was different to having the building and kind of like interpreted from the school, but some of the things we said was that having that, that the, it seemed like an inviting place and that it was a, a, not, a, not the typical place of education, right? We're gonna do things a little bit differently because we don't look like a school. We're not gonna do things like a school would normally do. Uh, mm -hmm. And also uh, just inviting the creativity with the color splash, and like, it seemed like they valued art and creativity and being different and being unique uh, and something, oh, openness. We had somebody, uh, one, uh, one of my group mates had mentioned being open and how I was inviting and open to kids uh, that are younger kids who want to come into the building and, uh, and learn. So, yeah. yeah. I truly think like the welcome is the most important part of the day, how you welcome students into your school. And that is a photo of Park Elementary in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, one of the schools that I've uh, worked with for the last two winters doing project-based learning. You guys should check them out. Um, mm -hmm. They just got a huge uh, renovation money in Louisiana to change some of those schools. And so that's one of the like most successful renovations. Uh, Monica? Yeah, well, it was really interesting. We had number six, which is a hallway. And I, we struggled, right? Because there weren't students in the picture. And so I think that whatever else we noticed, I think it was important for me to note, it really is about the students. Like we couldn't interpret what their school culture was very well without seeing kids interact with one another. Mm -hmm. And I think from my own school watching, um, we're a, a very new school, we've only been open for four years. And so watching the evolution of the culture at, our, at my own school, and in this, just in this past school year, we shifted from very staff driven to very student driven culture practices. And it made all the difference in the world, right? When our students were the ones making the decisions about what was important to them and how our culture looked. And so I, I just, I just really, um, it's, it's just important to keep that at the forefront. Like it doesn't really matter what we as staff think or what the hallways look like or, or anything else. I mean, some of that does play a part, but really in the end, it's about the students and it's about what they need for their culture. Mm -hmm. Monica, can I ask you, we drill down just five feet deeper. Uh, what's, what's one thing that you let the young people sort of uh, voice uh, mm -hmm. their opinions on? Yeah, so one of our advisors started a club called Hype Crew. And the Hype Crew is in charge of our weekly community meetings. Um, they plan them start to finish. They run them start to finish. Um, they decide on like fun pick me up games at community meetings. They decide like, um, with advisor support, obviously, like who, um, who they want to invite to come present at community meetings, um, that sort of thing. So there's a lot of ownership around that. And I think the community meetings have been a very central part of, of our, um, culture improving over the past year. The year, um, Hype Crew also plans like social events and dances and fun things too. So, so they've got a lot of stuff going on. The year prior to that, um, when we had even tougher culture problems, we actually had a club called Delta Club and they collected data on what kids felt like about, how they felt about culture, um, what they wish they could see change, um, and so that was very student driven as well. And while Delta Club um, didn't move into a second year, I think that the work that they did and feeling that ownership around, hey, they care what we think, um, really helped to drive the culture as we moved into um, this past year too. Um, other student voice opportunities like our Journalism club, like, is entirely like it's run by an advisor, but it's entirely contributed to by kids. So their voice is getting out, like how they're communicating through the school newspaper, that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, the, the hype crew was really the the biggest hype crew and community meetings were the biggest things for us this year. Mm. I love I love that name too, the hype crew. Mm -hmm. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Yeah. That's awesome. I really liked what you were saying about how like that picture was hard because there were no students in it. And I think that it's 
Um, and also the thing about the other school, um, the elementary school, like not looking like a school and so not being used like a traditional school. And it's hard when you're in a traditional school not to use it like a traditional school, right? Because you're in that same environment. You grew up there too. So you kind of know what it's supposed to look like. Um, and you could imagine that empty hallway like is in the middle of the school day, right? Because no one's in it. No one's there. Like, how can we um, reimagine like how all of our spaces in our school are being used? That's a that's what it triggered for me. So that's really awesome. Thank you, thank you everyone for sharing. Those were great. I'm really glad that people spoke up. Thank you. And a good point about the stickiness of culture, and uh, and the default culture and um, in buildings that sometimes they just sort of lull you into acting the way that we think school is. Um, and so I I. I had a mentor that taught me to like never come in a room and just leave it as is. So I'm known for always moving to the tables and stuff. And even in my uh, dissertation uh, defense, I sort of became infamous because I changed the panel. Like it didn't, it felt like a firing squad. So I just moved it so that it would feel like more like a collaborative. So please um, break stuff down, make it, make it be what uh, you want it to be. And, and in that spirit, we want to give you a gift. Um, to take home and, and do on your own. Um, we were having a lot of fun and so we're not gonna do it here, um, but I think uh, you've got the essence of, of the ideas and, and hopefully you, you've got some stuff to, to spark you. Um, what we put together was, and if somebody can share this on the screen or I can, uh, we put together a little design um, activity for you. And then a little- I can share it. That, Yeah, please, thank you. Um, um, that we hope um, is, is, is useful for you and it's um, generative. Um, use whatever is helpful to you and ignore whatever is not. Um, just some prompts to be thinking about, okay, you've got all these ideas, you've got Zelia's um, stories, we've got the conversation and your breakouts, you've got the pictures, like what's something that's sticking with you about like a commitment to something you really want to um, either add to your culture, change radically or strengthen? And then we've got some some prompting questions about you know what it is it that you where does it actually happen who are some allies what are some barriers or some ways in which you're going to be intentionally countercultural um, and then also be thinking about like outside of schools where does this happen so if you wanted to really infuse fun and maybe in your own memory you don't have an idea of a lot of fun in schools like think about where people have fun be thinking about like things that happen at amusement parks or things that happen in other places like where do people feel very respected and loved and that might be uh some of your family traditions or some some things that there's definitely a lot to learn from uh places outside of uh of schools and then we put a little reminder you know a lot of us virtual is our um our life so if you want to spend a little bit of time thinking about how it translates how things translate to a virtual space um we'll give you a couple prompts there and then um some some space to brainstorm and really uh don't forget the last thing maybe the most important and what we'll transition to right now is next steps uh make it actionable uh don't spend too time too much time on the planning just make it actionable and start to test things and, and do a little bit of a probe. I like the word probe because it's a little test, a little something that you can test the waters and that you can start to see it because, um, you know, we could sit and pontificate about things for a long time, but uh, culture lives in relationships and in, in real life and it doesn't really live on uh, in plans or on paper. Um, so it's it's good that you that you test things out and you, and you try them and that you fail early in and figure it out and learn along the way. So that's that's there for you. And um, and to wrap up, we want to uh, we asked you who who has a rock with them. We did ask this. This is a, a critical part of your pre work. Show me your rock if you have it. Um, this is the part where on your rock we're going to ask you to identify one aspect of culture that you want to prioritize this year. And um, and actually write it on the rock. And I think we asked you to bring a Sharpie too. So hopefully you're able to do that. So take a it moment. Won't on the size of your rock, just hold your rock and infuse it with your value until it's so wedged in there energetically. <laughs> and also, Thank you. And, and, and also for all my folks that don't have a rock, uh, you guys can click on the virtual link and you can write on a virtual rock. 
on the Padlet. So on the agenda, I'll share it with you guys quickly. Um, you can click here where it says this and please share your one actual next step item here. Take a look at this Padlet. And if you don't have a rock, you can write your next steps right here on these virtual rocks. Or if you got a bumpy rock. <laughs> As yep. A yeah. <laughs> And so the idea with this rock is that uh, we purposely want it to be something you can hold in your hand. You can put it at, at your desk where you work or you can carry it with you in your pocket. Rocks are a wonderful physical manifestation of your commitment. They hopefully are just as strong as your commitment to the thing that you are infusing this rock with energy. A good reminder when things get crazy, things get hectic, this is definitely a year of a lot of uncertainty and a lot of um, time. Uh, things going on, it can feel like you can sort of um, be pulled in a lot of directions. The rock is a good way to ground you. It's a grounding, literally a grounding force that you can sort of have in your pocket or hold, take a deep breath and remember what you're committed to. So um, it's not just a joke, it really is a practice. I literally, Zila and I actually found out in planning for this, we do this, we carry, I do carry a rock with me often in my pocket. Uh, maybe it's a little vulnerability next time I see you, you might ask me if I have one, carry them of different sizes and they just kind of remind you to like be, be grounded, take deep breaths, be in your feet and be your best self um, and, and really stay committed to those values. Uh, and with that, Sun, you wanna close us up? Or do we have some, some things on the Padlet? <coughs> Yeah, I, I don't have anything on the Padlet just yet. Hold on one second, Dave. Hold on. Oh, what's this? Dave, is this you? Nope. Uh, who's sharing? Who's sharing the screen? Cecilia? Nope. Ablin K at K T U F S D. Oh, all right. I'll get on that. Uh, all right. There we go. <laughs> All right, we got a couple here. Derek, plan out the town field trip to create experiences that students don't forget. Michael Clark, encouraged by advisory students to design their own monthly, I think community building activity, maybe. Michael, you could chime in there. And this person is gonna commit to uh, following through in that worksheet to process their learning a little bit, super cool. Um, the last thing I just wanted to say for attending today, we wanted to gift you guys also the BPL Culture Guidebook. Uh, so it's on the agenda. So everything that we talked about, so what we wanted to give you was uh, our guidebook that we created, particularly for our schools, how we think about the school structures and systems and culture guide. So you can read this at your leisure. There's a, a, a small amount of reading, 142 pages of resources, um, and how we view uh, culture that you can have now uh, and take a look at and look at some of our strategies. So we wanted to make sure that we give you something very concrete uh, leaving our session as well. Um, the last thing I just wanted to say, again, we're a community of lifelong learners. Uh, we really, this is our first time um, doing a virtual conference. So we, we would love your feedback. So on the bottom of the agenda, we have our survey. I know that uh, Dave is gonna put the survey on the um, chat and we would love, love your feedback on how this session went. And there it is on the chat. Um, so if you wouldn't mind taking a few minutes to sort of give us our, uh, some feedback, we greatly appreciate it. Other than that, Eva, Zilia, any final words? Um, I'm going to say that the virtual space, just as we were saying that like being in physical spaces can like, you know, have this cultural imprint that is hard to get away from the virtual space is not defined yet. And so I would see that as an opportunity for you to really figure out how you want your culture to be shaped. Um, and it's, you know, a different thing that not too many people have been offered. So, um, I'm excited to see what everyone comes up with. Yeah. Just posted the agenda again, yo. Yep, there it is. Thank you, thank you. Before I want to thank everybody that came and joined. It's July, it's the summer. You're a bunch of nerds that love our schools and love your young people because you're willing to do some work and, and really do some, you know, we kept it light and fresh, hopefully. Um, but this is really, really important stuff. 
it's literally life-saving stuff. So just really want to thank you for your commitment and for coming here. And I don't want to wrap without uh, lovingly uh, share, gushing about Zelia and just um, tell you um, th this is the benefit of uh, engaging your young people. Zelia actually got sent home from uh, college because they were closing up uh, school. And I believe with, with about the first week, I don't even know if you had landed in California. And she said, I know how to do this. Like, being at a school thing and she reached out and she, uh, I get the joy of working with her um, as she's interning uh, with us for the summer. And I gotta tell you, she is um, as bright and as talented as anybody that I've collaborated with. And I've uh, worked in some fancy places and worked with some uh, very top notch people. And I just like really wanna thank um, Celia and Son for stepping up and um, and joining me in this wonderful headliner and um, really you you really model um, the benefit. It's really selfish if uh, if you let young people do their amazing stuff, then then you get to learn from them and uh, and collaborate with them. So thank uh, you, thank you for that. Yeah, thank you to you both. You guys are awesome. Uh, I'm just dropping, man, Celia. Maybe you could drop your email. I'm dropping my email here. The folks that are on. Um, if you have any questions um, or want to follow up in any way, please let me know. Yeah, um, fun. The email I sent you guys uh, before, if you got that email, it has our emails as well. Um, someone said, son, that the agenda needs permission. Uh-oh. Yeah, I just, uh, I just double-checked that. It said anyone can open it. Uh, okay. Maybe a refresher, maybe needing to sign in to your Google Chrome. And also maybe if you're not using Google Chrome, it just might be a technical issue, but anyone who has the link can see it. Thank That's you all very much. Yeah. If you can't email us and we'll send it to you as a PDF. Thank you all.